So the first test, uh, able a air burst. The second test, tell us about Baker test. Ooh. Shot Baker, in hindsight, is one of those events if you could uh, go back and say, stop, you would do so. The test of Shot Baker, they took a, another Mark III bomb, removed its tail fin, put it in a caisson made from, I think, a submarine's conning tower, and as it was suspended by a cable 90 feet below the surface of the lagoon from the landing of the, it was the uh, amphibious assault ship LSM-60, which was placed in the center of the target ship formation. Now, 90 feet below the lagoon is halfway. It's about 180 feet deep there in Bikini. The scientists had predicted, if you're gonna detonate this weapon, you're gonna create this massive air bubble. And of course, basic laws of displacement. You're gonna, if the bubble's gonna expand outward, you're going to be pushing seawater. And they said, we're gonna, if the water's gonna come up, you're gonna form a water column. There was some fear if it reaches a certain altitude, then that water is gonna irradiate everything. Blandy knew this, a lot of scientists knew this, but they decided it was a calculated risk, let's go ahead and test. So on July 25th, 1946, at about 8.35 a.m. bikini time, they set off the bomb. What ended up happening, most Americans have seen in popular film or in television shows about atomic weapons, don't quite realize it. But what happens is the bomb detonates, it forms this massive air bubble from the gas, the gas wall, it's pushing both downward, so it goes down 90 feet and forms a crater about 30 feet deep, about 2,000 feet wide. Concurrently, it's taking all that sand and sediment and throwing it up with about 2 million tons of water. It forms a column 6,000 feet high, about 2,000 feet across, and the walls of it are about 300 feet thick. Of course, what goes up must come down. This will crash down on what's called a base surge, creating waves 94 feet high as well. We don't fully know the instrumentation was destroyed. We do know from photographic evidence that the waves were 94 feet high. These are the largest man-made waves ever recorded. As far as we know, the largest waves in recorded history. And this massive base surge picked up the battleship Arkansas, flipped her upright, so she literally slammed on the bottom upright, kind of crumpled and eventually sank. And that water completely doused everything. Highly irradiated sand, highly irradiated water, we have to realize these early plutonium bombs are not very efficient. So the 13.6 pounds of plutonium, 10 pounds of the plutonium is never fission. And so about 10.6, three pounds of it is fission. That plutonium is atomized, all the fission, fission products are atomized and mixed into all of this water and sediment. It, with a wave 94 feet high, all of the ships are covered with highly irradiated water or mist. The waves hit all the Bikini Islands. They're doused with this highly irradiated water, and the lagoon essentially becomes the world's first radiological disaster. So it's a, not a, it looks great on film. And, and the painting behind us actually depicts here, uh, Shot Baker, and you can see this massive water column that almost described, people call it almost a cauliflower look, when that came up, and in the initial blast, it forms a beautiful, uh, almost like a bowl, white bowl of mist uh, from the heat vaporizing the water. So it's, from an observer's standpoint, this is unbelievable, unbelievable force. But, compared to Abel, they attempt to go back into the lagoon, particularly to save the carrier Saratoga. At one time, battle cruiser of the United States Navy turned our third carrier, proud veteran of World War II. The Navy does not want to lose Saratoga, but it is simply too radioactive into the lagoon. It is, it is simply too hot. They, they tried going in about 30 minutes afterwards, they used drone ships, drone aircraft. They said, you just can't go in. And this was something that they were not fully expecting. They had been warned, but it still took them by surprise just how bad Shot Baker was. And it was a situation that the Navy, even though they knew, no one had bothered to test on a small scale. How do you decontaminate a ship? So if I stop you right there, I've seen pictures of seamen wearing their normal uniforms with uh, mops. And That's so, right. uh, I mean, this is what we were going in to decontaminate these ships with. There's, a, there's kind of a blind ignorance here. And it's, I don't mean in any way to belittle either the Navy or any of the personnel involved. We simply didn't know. This was science in its infancy. How do you decontaminate a ship once it's been irradiated? How do you decontaminate anything once it's been irradiated? 
no one had tested it. But the crossroads for that regard becomes a gigantic laboratory of how, oh, now that we've contaminated these vessels, can we save them? They tried, first they had to put out fires aboard some of the ships, but the problem is the fire ships are pumping irradiated water from the lagoon, which contaminates the crew members on these ships. Then they're getting drenched in irradiated water, their clothing's contaminated, in some cases they're ingesting water uh, from this, which has physical products, most dangerous of all, plutonium. So they said, okay, well, let's, let's try the old tried and true methods. Let's swab the decks. Let's scrub the decks of the ship. That doesn't work. They then try using different bead media to sandblast. They discover the only thing you can do is blast the ships down to bare steel in most cases. But then the problem becomes all the decking, all the rope, every crevice, every minute surface, physical material can be trapped in there. And it's near impossible to decontaminate the ship if it has the bilge pumps, for example. The bilge pumps are pulling in water from the lagoon. It's irradiated. All the piping then becomes contaminated. How do you decontaminate piping? The Navy tried acid washes to agree, and they basically said, why don't we just tear out the piping once we're in decontaminated water and, and rebuild it? So it just becomes this kind of impossible situation. And this leads kind of the follow-on, why is there not a third test? Right. What happens to Test Charlie? You know, test Charlie was meant to be a deep water test. Imagine almost like an atomic depth charge, so to speak. The problem is of the 95 ships, uh, I think about five are sunk in Shot Abel, 11 are sunk in Shot Baker. The remaining ships are literally too hot. They're, they're too contaminated to safely use. Well, thinking about all of the people who are monitoring and observing this, I mean, you mentioned earlier there's tens of thousands of people involved logistically in the whole entire process. What's now happening to all of those people in this process? In terms of the actual 42,000, I'll say approximately 42,000 personnel, uh, Dr. Stafford Warren is the chief radio radiological safety officer for Crossroads. He was the chief medical officer, safety officer during the Manhattan Project. And he's General Grove's personal kind of go-to guy for, for medical issues concerning radiation. Now, Warren ensured that he had a small staff, only about 30 personnel at first, to be what we call RADSAFE, or radiological safety monitors. This eventually will grow to about 300, but only about 30 of them have any real training. Personnel were issued dosimeters and were issued film badges to document the amount of exposure but they don't have enough what we call uh, personal protective equipment, or PPE at the in modern parlance. There's very little protective equipment. As you mentioned, sailors are stripped down to their skivvies, barefoot, trying to scrub these decks with the radioactive water all about them standing on contaminated surfaces. It's absurd in hindsight, but we simply don't know it then. But Warren made it very clear to Admiral Blandy, we gotta get out of this place. This place is going to kill us slowly. Was there one thing, one prop that he used? Blandy, uh, Warren tried several approaches, but what ultimately won, uh, which sounds amusing, is a fish. Not all the fish were killed in the blast. They, thousands and thousands of fish were killed by Baker and were floating up dead on the lagoon surface. But nature finds a way. There were still fish living in the lagoon, and they would, as part of the safety monitoring, they were catching the fish and dissecting them and doing studies on their radiation exposure. The fish, however, were so radioactive that you could literally section a fish, slap it on x-ray film, and it would perform an auto-radiograph. It would literally x-ray itself. And Warren took one of these radiographs to Admiral Blandy about August 9th or August 10th, 46, and explained that the reason the fish had x-rayed itself was the algae it was ingesting was itself radioactive, and it ingested plutonium. Then when the algae went into the fish, the fish absorbed it, and it began to appear in its scales and its bone structure. So you kind of made this ghostly image of a fish on an X-ray, piece of X-ray film. Admiral Blandy saw that, and in addition, was made aware that we could not detect plutonium. We could not detect the alpha, the ionizing alpha emissions from plutonium with the Geiger counters and with the electronic instruments available. They, they could detect plutonium through other methods, but they said, Admiral, we have no idea where it is. This fish confirms, however, it's in the lagoon. 
it's in the water. Our sailors are exposed to that water. Ergo, they are exposed to the plutonium. As a result of that, as Warren said, an X-ray of a fish did the trick. Landy decided to cancel Crossroads on 10 August 46 and in simple terms, get the hell out of Dodge.